Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Michael Alea. I am an associate professor here at NYU Langone Medical Center in Manhattan. Uh, we're very pleased tonight to be continuing our Langone Orthopedic mm -hmm. Webinar Series with something from the Sports Medicine Division entitled Emerging Techniques in ACL Reconstruction. Uh, I think there's lots mm -hmm. to talk about tonight. We've got a great panel. We've got great discussions, great cases, and excellent topics in this ever-evolving technical issue that we deal with on a daily basis. So briefly going to introduce what we're going to be doing today. We're going to have four talks, and then we're going to finish this with some case presentations by Dr. Jisrawi. The first talk is going to be about femoral tunnel drilling, medial portal versus the outside end guide by Dr. Mabel Shah, followed by a talk by me on quadriceps tendon autograft, the role of augmentation as well as biologics. Dr. Carter will talk about modern techniques in pediatric ACL reconstruction. Dr. Eric Strauss will discuss malalignment, which is another main issue in ACL reconstructions, followed by clinical case presentations by Dr. Jisrawi, who's our chief of sports medicine. So with that, I am going to take this away, and we're going to talk with Dr. Shah about femoral tunnel drilling options. So maybe we'll go ahead and take it away. Okay, guys, hold on. Let me get control of the screen. All right, I'm uh, Mabel Shah again, and I'm here to uh, start off our uh, webinar today to talk about ACL femoral tunnel drilling. Uh, and we're going to mainly talk about the medial portal guide versus outside in drilling. So, before we talk about where we are today, I think it's important to look at ACL reconstructions from a historical perspective. Uh, <clears throat> and what you know, the ACL reconstructions would most closely resemble what we do today was first uh, started in the 1980s, in which our more senior colleagues were using a two incision technique, uh, using a lateral incision that was used to carry down the dissection down to the lateral intermuscular septum. Uh, a rear entry guide was then placed around the posterior aspect of the lateral femoral condyle, uh, which allowed for outside in drilling of the femoral tunnel. Um, this technique allowed for excellent uh, anatomic positioning of the femoral tunnel and allowed the tunnels to be drilled independently. So as technology advanced and equipment advanced in the 1990s, um, we moved to an all intraarticular drilling of the femoral tunnel. This technique uh, called for the tibial tunnel to be drilled first, and then transtibial aimers were used to drill the femoral socket. This had the proposed advantages of better cosmesis with equivalent functions from the, from the two incision technique and proposed less morbidity in the, in the initial post-operative period due to a less of a dissection and, uh, and um, uh, fewer incisions. Um, this transtibial technique was actually the surgical standard for over two decades. Uh, towards the end of my training, a survey of surgeons in 2006 uh, who were performing ACL reconstructions, over 90% of them were, were using the transtibial technique. Uh, the advantages were the technical ease of, of, of this procedure with no need to hyperflex the knee and the ease of grasp passage since the tunnels were drilled in a collinear isometric fashion. Uh, it was pretty easy. There was no, there was no uh, turn to pass these grafts. Um, the disadvantages, of course, was that the femoral tunnel was dependent uh, on the tibial tunnel. And any, any, uh, a poorly placed tibial tunnel would then, would then compromise your femoral tunnel, either being commonly being too far vertical uh, or even anteriorly. Um, sometimes we're using smaller uh, um, grafts, such as in hamstrings, when you're drilling an eight millimeter tunnel, it was sometimes hard to hook the posterior, the posterior cortex, which led to uh, anterior non-anatomic tunnels. So these uh, non-anatomic tunnels with this technique uh, led to problems such as decreased rotational stability as seen with vertical tunnels, uh, tunnel widening, um, and also um, with anterior placed tunnels, uh, increased uh, tension in, uh, in, in rest, in flexion. So given these shortcomings, uh, the surgeons refocused their interest on um, anatomic uh, tunnel placement. So a brief review of the anatomy. As we all know, the ACL arises from the posterior medial wall of the uh, lateral frontal condyle in the, inter in the intercondylar notch. Uh, radiographically, uh, it lies uh, completely posterior to Blumenstadt's line. 
Arthroscopically, the bony landmarks we utilize are lateral intercondylar ridge, in which the entirety of the ACL lies deep to or posterior to. And then perpendicular to that, the lateral bifurcate ridge separates the tunnel, the ACL into our two separate uh, 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 bundles, the anteromedial bundle and the postlateral bundle. These bundles um, are named after their insertions onto the tibia, not on the femur. The anteromedial bundle is taught throughout the full range of motion, whereas the postlateral bundle, which is more important for lateral rotation, was tight in extension. So when we're critically evaluating our femoral tunnel placement, it's good to utilize a, a grid that was first described by, by Bernard and Hertel in 1997. Uh, this grid has the axis of both uh, deep and shallow, high and low on the y-axis, deep and shallow is on, on, on the x-axis. And you can see the parameters to the right, approximately 30% uh, 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 shallow and 30% uh, low uh, calls is where the anatomic uh, uh, tunnel placement should be, which is illustrated in red. This is a case that uh, presented for revision. And you know it's important to look at your femoral tunnel in, in both the coronal and sagittal planes. In the AP view, you can see that you know, the, the tunnels look reasonably uh, well-placed. But on the lateral view, um, if, you, if you think about that grid, uh, this tunnel is not only shallow or anterior, but it's high, and, uh, it's high uh, compared to where, where the anatomical uh, tunnel uh, placement should be in yellow. So Batoni uh, first described uh, a medial portal technique in 1998. In this technique, we created the femoral tunnel independent of the tibial tunnel through a separate anteromedial portal. Um, Ashish Betty in 2011 uh, showed that this technique um, allowed for more anatomic placement of the femoral socket. And in, the cat in, a, in, in this cadaveric study, allowed for better time zero stability to Lachman and pivot shift. Alan Thorn Getty, also showed that this Lachman, uh, this better Lachman uh, stability and uh, better uh, results with KT1000 were present even up to two years postoperatively. This technique allows for true parallel screw placement since we are drilling the femoral tunnel. And then if we are placing an interference screw, we're placing that interference screw uh, in, in, uh, in, in, uh, through the same tunnel. So in theory, th there should be no significant screw divergence. And as we decrease the oblique or increase tunnel obliquity in the coronal plane, that is thought to decrease uh, resting graft tension and flexion and possibly to fewer rates of uh, revision, which but that has not been shown clinically. So the purpose of the study is not to completely poo-poo uh, the transtibial uh, technique. It is still a viable technique. Uh, in fact, long-term long clinical studies comparing both the antimedial portal technique and transtibial technique have mixed results. Uh, two recent randomized controlled trials showed no differences uh, in functional outcomes. Uh, and the trans technique can also be modified. There's a, um, you can utilize flexible reamers, which can create a more, fe um, more anatomic femoral tunnel while still dr drilling the tibial tunnel first. And addition, modifications can be made to the, to the tibial tunnel to allow for a more anatomic placement. But you have to be careful because placing this tibial tunnel too far medially or approximately can lead to a short tibial tunnel and graft mismatch and a non-practical tunnel uh, to utilize for ACL reconstruction. So patient positioning when utilizing the anteromedial portal uh, technique is key. You need to be able to hyperflex the knee. You can either hyperflex the knee in a figure four position, or I like to hyperflex the knee laterally but you need to get to about 110 degrees because less than that, you risk uh, creating a short graph. Uh, sorry, a short, a short tunnel placement. Um, portals, portal positioning is also, is also critical, uh, though it has been described that people utilize a, a three uh, a portal with an anterolateral, anteromedial, and then an accessory anteromedial portal. I think most of us you can, can do this technique uh, um, using uh, just two portals, the standard anterolateral portal, which hugs uh, the uh, patella tendon, and then an anteromedial portal, which is basically down right at the joint line and approximately one centimeter uh, in front of the medial femoral condyle. When utilizing this um, portal, you can see you have ease of access uh, that you avoid the medial femoral condyle and can 
have direct access straight to the uh, femoral insertion of the anterocruciate ligament. <clears throat> so when I do this, uh, when I do the anterior portal technique, I like to first drill a uh, a a, a uh, mark uh, with a knee hyperflexion and just put the guide pin in for about a centimeter, and I look at it both the, from the anterolateral portal and then anteromedial portal. Uh, making sure I like the tunnel that's not too low or I'm not going to violate the, the articular surface, not too high. Um, and then, uh, again, I reintroduced the, the, uh, the camera lantern laterally. I drilled the guide pin. When you're drilling the guide pin, you, with, when you're using these spade tip guide wires, you can actually estimate the intraosseous distance and make sure it's not, it's not too, uh, too short. You have to take care when passing your reamers across the medial femoral condyle to not injure it. I utilize a suction device. I place a Fraser tip to clean out the bone fragments and then check uh, the back wall to make sure it's adequate. I'm not going to have any posterior wall blowout or risk fracture. And you can see here, uh, utilizing this technique, you can drill, you know, commonly 25, 30 millimeter tunnels without, without any issue. Um, so I do like to use this, this suction device. I think it really improves visualization. Again, you have to take care to when you're withdrawing the, the reamer. Um, sutures then shuttled into the knee um, for eventual graft passes. And the knee is returned into 90 degrees of flexion, and the back wall is checked. And again, uh, you can see a great uh, femoral tunnel was drilled. Okay. So this technique also has its disadvantages. I, as I alluded to, um, there is a significant risk of drilling short femoral tunnels, and there's a risk of posterior wall blowout if you're not careful. You need to hyperflex the knee uh, to 110, 120 degrees. Um, this hyperflexion commonly requires the use of a second assistant. Um, when you do hyperflex, if you don't do a, a good synovectomy, and uh, you know I utilize that that uh, the suction device. Um, you can't you can have poor visualization and then risk injury to the, to the articular cartilage or the meniscus. If you drill without flexing the knee, there is a risk of perineal nerve injury from the exiting guide pin. And in theory, you know, we're drilling these tunnels independently. They're not collinear, and they, there is a graft bending angle from the tunnels to the graft. And in theory, there will be increased stress on the graft. But I say theoretical because, again, no clinical increased failure rates have, have been described by utilizing this technique. So <clears throat> with these shortcomings, um, Kim described, first described, returning back to the outside-in uh, technique, but we're seeing the outside-in 2.0. Uh, the femoral outside-in guide is introduced to the lateral portal. Targeting hooks are then utilized to reference off the lateral femoral condyle and estimate where your femoral tunnel will be, utilizing th this hook on the bottom. The inner aspect is six millimeters in diameter. The outer aspect is nine millimeters diameter. Um, then you utilize um, these narrow diameter guide pins that can convert into retrograde drills. And uh, you, there's a rubber grommet you put on the, uh, on the trocar, and then you withdraw um, the, uh, the drill slowly with high revolution and you can measure the exact length of your, uh, of your femoral tunnel. And this allows for no incision outside in creation of the femoral socket. So when you're drilling that guide pin, uh, the orientation of that guide pin um, is qu uh, quite important in, to, in, in restoring uh, the normal uh, ACL anatomy. And Lubowitz described uh, the proper angle being 60 degrees off the uh, perpendicular of the femoral uh, axis as well as 20 degrees uh, anterior to the trans epilocondylar axis. And this would best recreate the uh, ACL footprint uh, in the length, uh, width, area, and angular orientation. So the advantages of this technique um, allows for independent tunnel drilling. There's no need to hyperflex with a second assistant. Uh, there's increased freedom of tunnel placement, and this is important, especially in a revision setting. You're, you can find intact bone easily uh, or more easily, and it's quite useful a uh, technique in uh, a pediatric ACL reconstruction with all epiphyseal drilling, which I believe we'll talk a little bit about in the future in, in, in uh, Cordelia's talk. So disadvantages, 
there's a possible risk of uh, a screw divergence because again, you're not drilling through the same, or you're not putting the screw in through the same through the same uh, uh, portal you're drilling the femoral tunnel in, tunnel in but in uh, a study from our institution, a cadaveric study, uh, this was shown not to be the case, um, and that uh, you could drill, uh, you could uh, put your screws in without much divergence. Um, there's an increased cost with these proprietary retro, retrograde cutting pins. And again, as in the anterior portal technique, there are some increased, uh, theoretical increased stresses because of uh, graft bending angles. So in this case, uh, the uh, outside in guide was utilized in a revision setting. Um, again, introduced to the anterolateral uh, portal, lateral portal and referencing off the uh, uh, posterior wall. Again, uh, the outer diameter there is nine. You can see the previously placed uh, tunnel over there. The uh, trocar is tapped into the position. The guide pin is drilled into the appropriate position. Uh, in this case, an 11 millimeter uh, tunnel was created. Um, referencing off that uh, rubber grommet, um, the guide is uh, drilled or retrograde uh, pulled out of the uh, knee and, uh, and the uh, appropriately uh, tunnel is created. Um, the knee is uh, flushed uh, of all the debris. And again, you can see uh, an anatomic placement of the femoral tunnel created in this revision setting. So I find it quite interesting, uh, you know, in, in many things, orthopedics, uh, history has uh, a chance to repeat itself. And after 40 plus years of ACL reconstruction, it seems that we have come a uh, full circle. Thank you very much. Uh, the next lecturer will be uh, Mike Alea, who's talking about quad tendon uh, ACL reconstructions, a newer, more innovative technique, uh, which is uh, coming, uh, becoming more and more uh, popular. Uh, all right, Mike, take it away. All right. Thank you, Mayhul. And let's, it's my task today to talk about quadriceps tendon autograph which is certainly an up and coming player in terms of ACL reconstruction. I guess commenting on what you said, Mayhul, uh, we're sort of coming full circle. I guess the same thing could be said for quad tendon because it was certainly more utilized in the past then it dipped a little bit when hamstrings started to take off a little bit. And now quadriceps tendon is becoming a bigger player in the ACL game. People are hot on it. It's something that every ACL surgeon should know how to do doesn't need to be the number one treatment option for patients uh, as well as physicians. However, to have it in our back pocket as a possible tool is something that I think that's going to be very, very important moving forward. So these are our disclosures here. So why quadriceps tendon autographed? Um, there's lots of reasons. You know, I guess the first one is going to be that in the appropriate setting, the quadriceps tendon could be an extremely strong, robust, useful technique to have in terms of either primary or revision ACL reconstructions. And we'll talk about some of the reasons why I use it um, in particular. So biomechanical advantages have certainly been borne out, particularly with regard to BTB or hamstrings. Obviously, the quad is one big, robust piece of tissue that's going to have a higher intraarticular volume than traditional bone patellar tendon bone autograft. And it's also been proven to have a higher load to failure, a larger cross-sectional area, and be more collagen than BTB. Clinical advantages could certainly include less donor site morbidity, and it has been shown in studies to have less morbidity than both hamstrings or bone patella tendon bone autograft. So when do I use quadriceps tendon autograft? It's certainly not in all players, nor do I recommend doing it in everybody. I think, uh, like I said before, having a useful armamentarium of options as a sports medicine surgeon is probably the, mo the most important thing that we can do in our practice and have that, ab that ability to, to have variation in what we do and indicate the right procedure for the right patient. So for me in my practice, my initial graft of choice is still bone patellar tendon bone, despite some of the biomechanical advantages of quadriceps tendon. 
That being said, quadriceps tendon has certainly come over hamstrings as my second most utilized graft choice. So in particular for me, when I like to use this graft to be in any patient with abnormal tibial tubercle anatomy, history of Osgood slaughters, prior surgery on the patellar tendon or the patella, revision cases could be um, extremely useful for quad tendon reconstruction. And, and that's because you can either use soft tissue or you could use a piece of bone from the patella if you want direct bone to bone healing. Pediatric cases uh, can certainly be, be good for quadriceps tendon. And that's because you don't have to take a piece of bone all the time. You can do an entirely soft tissue quadriceps tendon reconstruction and, and drill through the physis even if you need to, as long as you're not putting a piece of plastic or metal across the physis probably wind up being fine, but I'll let Dr. Kerr talk a little bit more about that. Patients with kneeling concerns um, can benefit from this over bone patella tendon bone. If you anticipate a patient that's going to have significant mismatch issues with bone patella tendon bone, particularly for someone with a very long tendon, you can certainly consider quadriceps tendon autograft if you think that your fixation would be in jeopardy. Uh, if you have any incisional concerns over the tibia from prior surgeries and you want to be minimally invasive on the tibia in terms of the size of the incision, you can certainly do an all-inside quadriceps tendon autograph with just a small stab incision over the tibia and certainly have a lot less, um, a lot less anxiety over the possibility of a post-operative infection or wound complication. As well as any patient that you're doing a concomitant high tibial osteotomy on, I love the option to use an all soft tissue autograft, which is going to be decent in terms of length and size, where I can get a robust piece of tissue and not have to worry about anything in terms of mismatch. So in terms of the anatomy of the quadriceps tendon, it's got two good factors in that it's long and it's thick. It's about seven to eight millimeters thick at its, at its most robust portion, about two and a half to three centimeters above the patella. It's certainly very wide and it can range anywhere from about two and a half to three centimeters wide when it comes to the insertion site onto the patella. And it's long, so you can get a very long graft as well. Just like hamstrings and BTB, you would imagine that this increases with age, height, and weight, and this has been certainly proven to do such. And one thing that I always look for, very similar to hamstrings, is that height has been shown in the patients to be the most important predictor of the actual length of the quadriceps tendon. So if you're looking for uh, a patient that's going to have adequate length, I certainly would not be scared or skeptical of using quadriceps tendon autograft. So what I really want to do today is delve into the surgical technique of this because it's something that I really didn't start doing again for about maybe until about two years ago. I certainly had my questions, but those questions have been answered with experience. And like all surgeries, there's certainly a, a learning curve involved in, in, in such. So in terms of patient positioning, you know, you could use it, you could easily either utilize it two ways. You can position it like this, which was sent to me from a friend, Nate Enders, over at University of Vermont, uh, where the patient is po uh, positioned with a bolster under the foot, as well as a side post to get 90 degrees of flexion and put the quadriceps tendon on stretch. Or you can do a tra uh, traditional leg holder, as long as something keeps the knee bent to 90 degrees to really give you good tension on the quadriceps. That's really what's most important. I always like to look at my preoperative MRIs as well. And in this picture, you can clearly see why the quad tendon has got more collagen than BTB. If you look at the widest section of the BTB at its midpoint, it's about 3.8 millimeters. If you look at the quadriceps tendon at its midpoint, it's about 7.1, 7.2 millimeters. So you're obviously going to get a thicker graft than that of bone patella tendon bone if you're going to use quadriceps. And I think a point about two and a half to three centimeters proximal to the tip of the patella can really give you a good gestalt in terms of how thick your graft is going to be. In terms of the technique and the incision, I like to air it just a little bit medial so I can get it just off the VMO. Some people like to make small incisions and use some uh, devices that are made by pharmaceutical or implant companies, which is certainly reasonable. Some people like to make bigger incisions and actually visualize the entirety of the quadriceps tendon. I think both techniques are fine as long as the surgeon uh, and their staff is, is versatile and they are uh, in understanding of the anatomy of the quadriceps and they are understanding of the ways to get as thick and as good as a of a graft as possible. 
And again, there's certain uh, implants and certain cutting devices that you can use to harvest the quadriceps tendon. For me, I like the double blade technique where it gives me a fixed um, width of the graft at, at all times. Uh, I usually use this for bone patella tendon bone, but I also use it for quadriceps tendon as well. And then again, there's some proprietary devices that have kind of sort of gone through peaks and valleys in terms of their uh, ability to get a good graft, but there are some new devices now on the market that are being uh, shown to be a little bit more reproducible. Uh, for me, again, I like to have that constant um, thought that I'm going to get a, a, the same kind of the width of graft the entirety from proximal to distal. In terms of the size of the incision, if you're first going to be starting out with quadriceps tendon, uh, I certainly recommend making a lengthy incision. You're going to want to see everything. You're going to want to see the strip of the rectus femoris as it comes proximal and dives in between the vastus lateralis and the vastus medialis. When I first started doing this, I was a little bit afraid to go as proximal as possible. And then once I found that you can certainly do this without detriment to the patient, you can certainly get a longer graft. So don't be afraid to go as proximal as possible with both the incision as well as the harvest site off the rectus. As Dr. Carter will talk about, you, you can have issues with the rectus when you do this in kids, so it's certainly an important thing that we have to think about. Uh, you can certainly decrease the size of the, your incisions with time and with increased comfortability in terms of doing this. Now, the good thing about the quad and the soft tissue right over this area is that it's certainly pliable. You can make a smaller incision, extend the knee to access the, the patella, flex the knee more to access the proximal quadriceps. You can certainly shift around the um, positions of the retractors inside the knee to get adequate exposure. In terms of where you're harvesting from, you can either start this proximally or you can start it distally. It really doesn't matter. Uh, for me, I like to start it proximally, but the key here is if you're going to go full thickness or if you want to get as robust of a graft as possible, is not to forget the intermedius. What I like to do is put a traction stitch at the top of the uh, rectus femoris, including the intermedius. That, that way I have something to pull up on as I'm harvesting the quadriceps right off the capsule. I, sir, I for one, prefer to take a full thickness graft rather than a partial thickness graft, but there are some instances where you want to take a partial thickness graft, such as in like a soccer player who really needs to generate force from their rectus femoris uh, to get the maximum ability to kick the ball and provide um, strength to their, to, the, to their ability. But I think the traction suture is helpful to peel it directly off the capsule. If I'm going to take a piece of bone, I usually utilize an ACL saw with a one centimeter depth stop, particularly over the proximal patella. I think it's very easy to cut too deep and it could certainly lead to an iatrogenic injury like a fracture. If you're a little bit unsure of the, of the size of the block, you can certainly aim for a smaller bone block if you want to be safe. And again, if you're just starting out doing this, you can certainly do this with no detriment to the patient. And as you feel more comfortable doing so, you can aim for a, a thicker bone block. Again, these are two pictures showing that you can certainly get uh, a very robust graft with a decent size incision. Uh, you do not need to close the, the defect in the quadriceps after this is done. Some people do, some people don't, but there's no clinical differences in terms of closing the defect or not. And this is basically what it will look like intraarticularly. Uh, it doesn't have that same a uh, beautiful striation that a BTB would have uh, when you go inside the joint after you put place the ACL in. But again, you can see this very thick, robust graft in there. Certainly a lot of collagen inside the knee to give adequate strength to the ACL reconstruction. These are one of those proprietary techniques that we talked about that can be done through a minimally invasive incision. Uh, some people actually use the arthroscope to kind of dive up with the uh, proprietary harvester. And again, this is something that you might want to try out first in the lab a few times before you do, uh, because again, this can be potentially prone to errors. So if you're first starting out doing quadriceps tendon autograph, certainly aim for a bigger incision. Uh, make sure that you can see the exact parameters of the tendon that you're going to be getting. For me, the technique is very similar to what Mabel talked about for, this, uh, for the femoral socket. I drill through the medial portal. Tibial tunnel is done in the standard fashion. Typically, the bone block will go into the femur with a metal interference screw. I always use an anchor to back this up in the tibia, such as a, uh, a knotless anchor device. For the bone graft harvest, for the bone graft site um, on the patella, I typically put some DBM in there to try and endorse some healing and get more um, 
uh, a more significant bony healing process. And the rehab for me is pretty much the same as BTB. And I typically will go all inside, uh, all soft tissue rather than bone block when I'm combining this with an HTO or if there's any concerns about the patella. And, you know, the good thing about the quadricep is that the clinical outcomes are good. They're, you know, they're just as good as hamstrings and, and BTB in some of these uh, larger studies. Lachman exams are excellent postoperatively. The stability is excellent postoperatively. The outcome scores are excellent. There is some debate still in terms of literature, in terms of full versus partial thickness graphs, as well as taking a piece of bone versus using all soft tissue. And some of the benefits of using a bone block, obviously, would be for the benefit of bone healing. This is great for revisions, but it is a little bit technically more difficult. It will add some time to the harvest, and it has been shown to have a higher complication rate than the all soft tissue grafts, which can be shorter. Again, you're relying on suspensory fixation above and below in terms of your uh, fixation. It is a quicker time to harvest the graft, and there's potentially increased cost, however, if you use certain implants. Less complications according to certain meta-analyses, and this might be less ideal for revisions. That being said, there are no clinical differences when looking at bony versus all soft tissue. And the same thing holds true in terms of partial thickness versus full thickness. There have really not been any clinical differences borne out to date in large meta-analyses done out of Pittsburgh. However, again, for the partial thickness grafts, there might be a faster harvest. There's no violation of the capsule, uh, and you certainly can rely more on proprietary harvesters as opposed to the full thickness grafts, which have a little bit of a higher risk of capsular violation and fluid extravasation. If that happens, you can easily put a stitch in there to minimize the amount of extravasation. It does take a little bit longer to harvest it, and it's technically a bit more challenging. And if you're going to use full thickness, I think it's a lot easier to do it under direct visualization using a 15 blade than rather than using a harvester. Complications uh, are basic. They include hematoma. They include cosmesis. Uh, particularly for, for young women, they don't really love if they're sitting down and they're able to actually see their scar when they're sitting down. It's certainly something that I've been talked to uh, with some of my patients. Uh, one of the main errors here is patellar fracture, and you can get that, especially if you start too lateral on the patella. So you really want to stay uh, medial on the tendon as well. Uh, that way you get a nice a uh, thick piece of tendon tissue with less risk of, um, of injury to the patella. And again, uh, because you're using soft tissue fixation in the tibia, uh, I'll use a big interference screw in the tibia, then I'll back it up with a knotless screw to provide cortical fixation on backup. One thing that's certainly hot in the literature right now are these augments, uh, meaning like a addition of a high tensile strength suture to ACL reconstruction. It's getting a lot of play in terms of biomechanical research, and pretty much all the studies out there show improvements in biomechanical strength at time equals zero. That being said, there's really no clinical data to show superiority when you add this piece of suture into an ACL reconstruction. The caveats with this and the problem is that it will certainly increase your operative time, it'll increase your cost, and we really need more effective, non-biased by industry data, whether or not this actually works. And for me, what I like to think about when I'm doing this is that, you know, I, I find it very hard that a, a suture is going to provide significant uh, rotational stability uh, when you look at it in comparison to the size of the actual graft. I mean, that thing is about one-tenth to one-twelfth the size of the actual graft. So it might provide some benefit at time equals zero, but when we talk about the complex interplay of all the ligaments of the knee and biomechanics of pivoting, addition of one strength will, of one suture will certainly increase cost, but it may not increase clinical outcomes. So for me, uh, when I think about why ACLs fail, they're most commonly because either they're poorly done or there's comp concomitant pathology that could not be addressed appropriately, or you have to do a high grade uh, meniscectomy. And it's not really because the graft was too weak. And the last thing I'll talk about is biologics, which certainly we think is the wave of the future. Uh, but unfortunately, just like everything in this world, we, we simply don't have the answer. There was a recent study done by Elisabetta Cohn out of Italy, uh, who's one of the champions of biologics um, basically on the entire planet. And they looked at PRP, they looked at BMAC, they looked at adipose, 
uh, to see if any of these really provided significant outcome improvements after ACL repair or reconstruction. And what they found was that current evidence is still lacking sound data to support the use of biological agents and that no clinical superiority has been described when using PRP uh, in ACL reconstruction. So unfortunately, although this is something that's being highly studied, we still don't have adequate data showing superiority. What we do know is that increased costs, but the superiority question is certainly still out there uh, to be determined. So with that, I would like to basically thank everybody for their time. I'll skip the summary due to time constraints, and we will move on to Dr. Shaw and Dr. Carter and talk about some pediatric stuff. So thank you to everybody. Mike, great talk. Um, there's been a couple of questions from uh, our audience. Uh, first, uh, several questions have been asked uh, about, have you noticed any significant quad weakness uh, after uh, using the quad tendon or harvesting the quad tendon for ACL reconstruction? Yeah, so it's been shown in some biomechanical studies uh, as well as some clinical studies that you could certainly have some increased quad, uh, quadriceps muscle weakness after you harvest the quad tendon, certainly when it's compared to hamstrings, but the converse is also true in terms of hamstring flexion strength. So there are some patients that you might want to be careful about on the quad, like a soccer player who needs that kind of extreme torque to generate the maximum velocity of their shots and their passes. So you might want to go partial thickness on somebody like that. Uh, so yes, the answer is it could take them a little bit longer time to reactivate their quadriceps and gain that maximum quadriceps strength. Uh, but again, the converse, like we said, is also true with hamstrings. You lose that flexion strength. And the same thing with BTB in terms of um, getting the quadriceps strength back as well. And uh, another question they ask is, what do you think about the, the failure rate of quad tendon uh, reconstruction compared to the other autograft choices? So it's still something that we're looking at. Um, the stability trial part two is, is started now in the United States, the United Kingdom and Canada looking at quad versus BTB plus or minus extra articular tenodesis. It's probably going to be the most highly regulated controlled randomized trial that's actually happened uh, on this in quite some time. If you look at the Danish or the Norwegian registry, I think it was Danish, uh, that was published about a year ago, it found that there was a higher rate of failure in quad tendons, but this was from reconstructions that were done a, quite a significant amount of time ago. We didn't have the same fixation options. We didn't have the same rehab options. We didn't know as much as we know about it now. I think that as people are studying it more and doing more controlled randomized trials, I think we're going to have more data. I guess anecdotally speaking for me is that I really haven't noticed a higher fa failure rate in my patients that get their quad tendon done. But again, I'm doing it for different reasons. So it's kind of hard for me to compare apples to oranges. I mean, BTB is still my gold standard in the office. I typically recommend that most for young active patients. I will use quads in what I think is the right scenario. But again, it's hard for me to compare apples and oranges anecdotally. All right. Thanks, Mike. Um, there's many more questions, but I think in the interest of time, we're going to move on to our next talk. Our next talk is Cordelia Carter talking about uh, pediatric ACL reconstruction. Take it away, Cordelia. Thanks, Mayhul. I have no disclosures. Uh, so in brief, we've uh, seen a, a really um, rapid and uh, steep increase in the rate of ACL injuries in kids over the last 10 to 20 years both uh, the, the injury itself as well as the reconstruction. Maybe we're better at diagnosing this. Maybe it's actually a true increase in the rate of injuries due to things such as sports specialization. Um, this is just one study that highlights that. So you can see over in the last decade, we, had, we saw a 20% increase in the ACL injury and a nearly 30% increase in the rate of reconstruction in the pediatric population in the US. And this is frustrating because prevention programs exist and they are effective. And I've listed here, you know, the things that we work on with the prevention program um, and some of the data that tells us that when we implement them correctly, they, they work. Uh, but so what happens when prevention doesn't work? And so that's the kid who comes to your office and he or she or they say, you know, I, I'm, I twisted my knee. I heard the pop. I felt the pain. And then, there, and then the tears. We do your clinical exam, just like you do for any other patient. We start with a radiographic assessment. Again, just like for any other patient for children, you're looking uh, not just at alignment, but you're looking for physio patency um, as well as uh, concomitant fractures. We'll do our MRI, which is both uh, sensitive and specific in the pediatric population. And again, allows us to assess uh, the, the status of the physis. 
And then unlike um, our, the adults uh, population, we also will do a skeletal maturity assessment. We'll look at a bone age study, uh, which is a PA radiograph of the left hand. This allows us to predict the remaining growth. We'll do tanner staging, which is another way to do this. And then for females, we'll ask about monarchal status. Uh, historically, and this is another thing that is unlike the treatment for adults, uh, but the treatment uh, historically was non-operative. We did bracing and therapy and activity restriction until uh, skeletal maturity was reached. The rationale behind this was to protect the physes. However, we now know that the natural history of pediatric ACL deficient knees that are treated in this way with delayed reconstruction is actually quite poor. We've known this since 2002, actually, when ACROTH showed us that, that patients treated as such had early onset arthritis and poor function. And a more recent uh, meta-analysis demonstrates lower instability episodes, lower rates of secondary injury, higher functional outcome scores, and higher return to sport rates for kids who were treated with surgical reconstruction despite their skeletal immaturity. And not just uh, surgery itself, but also we have to think about the timing of surgery because there are also, there's several studies in the literature that demonstrate that kids who have uh, a delay in their time from injury to surgery have poor outcomes. Um, this is just one study I've listed here that looked at 370 patients, but kids who had their reconstruction more than 150 days after their injury were way more likely to have medial meniscus tears, chondral injuries, and those injuries when present were, make, were more likely to be severe and irreparable. And so while there does remain a role for non-surgical treatment uh, of, of a, an ACL injury in kids, and this is somebody who comes in with no functional instability, a low demand patient, or sometimes a partial ACL tear, uh, by and large, the gold standard treatment uh, for children at this point is timely surgical reconstruction. And the goals of this are to restore stability and function, to prevent additional intraarticular injuries and therefore mitigate the development of osteoarthritis, and that while doing this, we want to protect the physes. So we want to avoid an iatrogenic limb length discrepancy or angular deformity. Uh, and, and in terms of physeal considerations, so, you know, why do we even talk about this? And the reason is because our traditional surgical techniques directly violate the growth plate. And this can be injured through direct drilling or just thermal injury, placing fixation devices too near the growth plate, a bone block across it, or dissection too near the perichondrial ring. Uh, in terms of how much uh, physeal disruption may lead to arrest. So our longstanding orthopedic dogma tells us that once you get to more than seven to 9% of physeal volumetric injury, you're more likely to, um, to see a physeal arrest. There have been some studies, and again, I've listed one here that have used computer modeling to simulate this. So if, you know, if you're gonna do a trans physeal tunnel, you wanna know the volumetric injury. This study uh, made eight millimeter tunnels in the MRIs of kids 10 to 15 years old and found that less than 5%, in fact, less than 3%, as you can see here, of both femoral and tibial physes um, were violated. And they also found in this study that verticalizing the tunnels by five degrees led to a volumetric decrease or a, volume, a decrease in volumetric injury. These things are important because there are some people who will still do a transficeal reconstruction for, uh, for any patient, regardless of, of the degree of skeletal immaturity. And then verticalizing the tunnels is one of our ways of protecting the physis if we're going to do a transficeal reconstruction in a child who is not yet skeletally mature. So there is a treatment algorithm that's generally accepted for an ACL tear in a skeletally immature patient. You can see all the way on the left here are the prepubescent kids. Those are who are Tanner stage one or two, males less than 12, females less than 11. These kids are gonna get a physeal sparing ACL reconstruction. And I've listed the two most common techniques here, which we'll go through. In the middle are the young adolescents with growth remaining, Tanner stage three to four, males 13 to 16, females 12 to 14. In my hands, at least they're typically getting a trans physeal ACL reconstruction, but we may think about using some physeal sparing techniques. Uh, and sometimes we'll do a partial transficeal or a hybrid reconstruction, transficeal in the tibia to get a little bit more um, length of that, uh, of that tunnel and more graft in the tunnel, and then an all epiphyseal in the femur. And then lastly, all the way to the right, the older adolescents with closing physes, Tanner stage five, so these are really skeletally mature adolescents and they can have an adult type ACL reconstruction with uh, anatomic tunnels. And I've put here autographed on purpose, hamstring BTB or quad tendon. And, and this population um, autographed is, is the graft of choice um, for sure. So let's go through and look first at physeal sparing ACL reconstruction using an autographed iliotibial band. Indications for this surgery are a complete symptomatic tear in a kid with significant remaining growth. So we call this the IT band ACL reconstruction. Good things about it, there's no tunnels drilled, there's no metal fixation and it's autographed soft tissue. 
In terms of the steps, um, the cartoons on the left are taken from Coker's uh, surgical technique paper, and then the pictures uh, on the right are uh, patients of mine. But the first step is harvesting the graft. And so you can see here, we take the central, uh, I usually take at least the central two thirds of the iliotibial band, leaving two to three millimeters anteriorly and posteriorly. And I take an extra long length as well. And you can make a counter incision proximally to make sure that you don't prematurely amputate that graft. But what we're looking at here is the IT band, once it's been harvested and then whip stitched, um, whip stitched at one end, left attached degrees tubercle distally. The next step is, is arthroscopic. So here we're looking at a vascular clamp that's um, placed through the uh, anteromedial portal. It's going around the back of the femur to grab those stitches and then to shuttle the graft around the top of the femur and into the knee. And this is what it looks like on the right here. Um, the IT band graft you can see is coming as being shuttled into the knee. And then, it and then you shuttle it under the intermeniscal ligament. So that graft is under the anterior intermeniscal ligament, grabbing those sutures to then um, dock it outside the knee. And that's what these pictures are showing. And then lastly, it's surgical fixation. So it's suture fixation over the lateral femoral condyle, which is what we're looking at on the left here. And then it's surgical fixation just with stitches um, that are, that are um, placed actually underneath the periosteum, medial to the apophysis, distal to the physis. And then this is the, the Carter modification of this. I take a super long graft and then I flip it back up on itself because then I can put, I can use the Vicryl sutures on top of those uh, non or the uh, non-absorbable ones so that you don't get as much irritation from the stitches. And this is what the final product looks like in the knee. You can see the nice bicruciate appearance. Uh, the second, or the, the, the other um, sort of main uh, physeal sparing acial reconstruction is the olipiposeal. Uh, it's, it's the same indication as one we just went through. Differences are, so there is a soft tissue autograph, typically a hamstring used. There are tunnels drilled and these are extra physeal. And then fixation can be variable. I've, I've uh, shown here what this looks like. You can see uh, on that picture on the left, that's an intraoperative fluoroscopic view of your femoral tunnel uh, being drilled in an all epiphyseal fashion. And then the final product on the right um, with suspensory fixation on the tibia and that tunnel as well as all epiphyseal. In terms of outcomes from these, there's a couple of recent studies that have uh, looked at both of them. So at a Boston Children's Hospital, uh, this was published in 2018, looking at 237 patients, and they had pretty good follow-up on this. Average age, 11.2 years at time of surgery, and then at two years after surgery, 97% Lachman A, you know, a 1A, 98% negative pivot. The patient reported outcomes at six years were excellent, 6.6 .6 rate of graft re-rupture, and no significant growth disturbance reported. For the olipiposeal one, this is the um, CHOP experience in Philadelphia, retrospective review looking at 103 patients, 12 years at the time of surgery, a weakness, this is only six month minimum follow-up. They had a 10.7% uh, graft rupture rate. They did see some growth disturbance. They did see some arthrofibrosis as well as contralateral ACL injury. Moving on to the transficeal ACL reconstruction or the hybrid. So the indication for this, again, is a complete and symptomatic ACL tear in a young adolescent with some remaining growth. You're going to employ potentially physeal respecting techniques, which might include we're going to use a soft tissue graft, not a bone plug. We're almost always going to use autograft because we know that there's a four times greater re-tear rate of your ACL with um, allograft use in this population. You're going to think about using metaphyseal fixation, minimizing dissection near the perichondrial ring, verticalizing the tunnels avoid over-tensioning it as you're securing it. And then if you're really concerned, you can think about using instead a partial transficeal or a hybrid technique, again, avoiding the tunnel over the distal femoral physis or across the distal femoral physis, which is the fastest growing growth plate in the body. Uh, outcomes of this, this is an old study and it's because you know the outcomes of this are all over the place, but this is again, the Boston Children's Experience. Uh, and what they basically showed was a revision rate of 3%, which is excellent. And I suspect is different if you were to go back and look at it now. And the picture on the left here is, you know, looking, you're looking in the, in the femoral tunnel and that white line is the physis. And then lastly, the adult type ACL reconstruction using anatomic transficeal tunnels. And they're not really transficeal because the physis is not present and somebody has got a closing or closed growth plate, but again, using autographs. 
Uh, I'm, I was just going to throw in here the data in kids on quadriceps tendon. It's something I use at this point actually almost exclusively for the reasons I've listed here. Um, you don't have to use bone plugs, so there's no risk for fysial arrest that you may see with BTB. But however, it's reliably long and thick enough, and so there's no need for five stranding your hamstrings or augmenting your hamstring. Um, it has good biomechanical properties. And then if you're thinking about choosing a graft for somebody who's got an ACL tear and potentially has a, a high quad hamstring ratio as, as the etiology or a contributing factor to their ACL tear in the first place, then you can think that you're not going to just take a hamstring and send them back and having potentially worse than that. In terms of what we know about the use of quad tendons, this is some early data in the pediatric population. This comes out of Rady Children's in San Diego. Uh, these guys looked at, they basically did a head-to-head -head quad tendon versus hamstring, followed these primary ACL patients over time. And what they found was that those who had received quad tendon autographs, the grafts themselves were significantly larger than hamstrings. And per perhaps more important, the hamstring autograph patients were significantly more likely to tear the ACL graft. And so they concluded that doing an ACL reconstruction with quad tendon autograft may reduce early graft failure in these patients. In terms of what we know about the anatomy, this is just one um, anatomic study, you know, a cadaveric study done in kids about how to safely harvest this graft. So nine cadaveric knees in children. They looked at the quad tendon width um, and found that it was wider superficially near the patella and then it was wider, deeper, more proximally. And I think this is where we get into trouble is not recognizing its trajectory. And that's why I, I will echo Dr. Alea's sentiment to do this open, especially when you're learning. And then, um, you know, the rectus separation from the deeper quad occurs at a median length and they, they've got a little, uh, um, a little, uh, you know, ratio here that you can use. Um, but really the, I think the important thing is that, um, you, th that for kids, because the rectus separates from the quad within the zone of harvest for your autograft and that this puts their, them therefore at risk for possible rupture, retraction or recession, which I have seen that um, you have to be able to repair the heart. And so you need to have a big enough incision so that you can see proximally and, and make sure that you've got a robust repair. I wanted to mention lateral extraarticular tenodesis. It's popular in the adult world. It's also popular in the peds world. This is a pediatric specific technique that's been described. This comes out of Texas Scottish Rite. These authors looked just at high risk knees, those specifically who had hyperextension or an increased posterior tibial slope. Um, and then for these kids, they added their technique that I'll describe in a second for an LET with the theoretical benefits of increasing the graph size uh, as well as increasing rotational control. So it's akin to an ALL reconstruction. If you look at this, this um, depiction that's in their paper, so it's basically the IT band harvest that I just described for a, a traditional IT band uh, reconstruction. So that's, your, that's one graft. You drill your femoral tunnel, and this is transficeal, you can see. But you drill your femoral tunnel the very same way you would. You drill your tibial tunnel the very same way you would, but you upsize it one to two millimeters. With your IT band graft, you, you secure it on the femur, you loop it over the back, and then you put it through the tibial tunnel and you flatten it out against the posterior wall. And then while you're holding tension on that flattened tendon, you pull your graft, ret the, the primary graft, retrograde, flip your button, and then you fix them both in the tibial tunnel with a screw. And what they found looking at 60 knees of kids who are 12.9 years old on average followed for almost two years. They had high functional outcome scores, a really low retear rate and no growth disturbance. And so concluded that lateral augmentation of traditional transficeal soft tissue ACL reconstruction reliably results in high function and low retear rates in young athletes. I'm gonna blow through my last couple ones here, but in terms of kids, you know, we don't have standardized rehabilitation and return to play guidelines. What we do know is that even nine months after ACL reconstruction, many kids are not actually ready to protect their knees safely. I wanted to mention the concept of psychological readiness, because when we talk about techniques, I think we also have to think about our, our techniques of, um, of rehab and returning kids to play. And we know that kids who are not psychologically ready are way more li or have fear are way more likely to have a second injury. And we see complications like stiffness. We really focus on growth disturbance. I personally think the dirty little secret of pediatric ACL reconstructions is the graft rupture rate, which is incredibly high. And if you look at this one, this is a recent paper that demonstrated it to be as high as 32%, 20% the ipsilateral leg, 13% the contralateral leg. Um, and this is a real problem. 
And it's a real problem because if you don't get it right the first time, you're even less likely to get it right the second time. A couple of new papers that have come out about revision ACL reconstruction in kids recently, if you look at these outcomes, 20% graft re-injury rate, 20% contralateral ACL, 55%, this is the Boston Children's Experience, go back to sports. This is again, San Diego. If you just look to the bottom here, only 27% of their revision patients, these are still adolescents, go back to sport at the same level and 21% have a, a re-rupture of their graft. And so in summary, Ficeal sparing and Ficeal respecting ACL reconstruction techniques both afford biomechanical and functional improvement, but our current management is imperfect because we still see high rates of re-injury, re-operation, and we still see growth arrest. Improvements in technique, including using quad tendon and LET and thinking about how we do post-operative rehab in a, a systematic way are being made. And yet continued study of this population with good studies um, is needed, I think, for us to affect better outcomes. Thanks. Hey, thanks, Courtney. Uh, great talk. Um, next up is uh, Eric Strauss. Uh, Eric's going to be talking about a difficult problem we have um, and sometimes uh, patients, especially in the vision setting, come with a malalignment of extremities. And uh, Eric's gonna be talking about how do we address these malalignments during uh, ACL reconstruction. Thank you, uh, Mehul. And thanks to everyone who's tuning in for joining us for this webinar. It's been great so far. I always like hearing, hearing my colleagues talk. I always pick up something new. So thanks for that. Um, as Dr. Shah mentioned, I'm gonna be talking about addressing coronal malalignment during ACL reconstruction. So I, I have a few disclosures. You can find them on the AOS website. So what we're gonna do in the next 10 to 15 minutes is we're gonna discuss normal anatomic coronal knee alignment, talk about the role this coronal malalignment will play in ACL failure. And then I wanna kind of give you a step-by-step -step guide to addressing genuvarum in combination with ACL reconstruction and then discuss the outcomes and complications of combining these two procedures. So as, as you all know, in a normal lower extremity, the coronal alignment is defined by the mechanical axis that connects the center of the femoral head with the center of the tibial plafond. This mechanical axis typically passes through the center of the knee, just lateral to the medial tibial spine. The definition of varus malalignment is considered when this mechanical axis is medial to the apex of the medial tibial spine, as you see here, or less than 41% across the tibial plateau when measured from its medial uh, aspect. So managing varus malalignment on its own is a very complicated topic. You can see this algorithm that's been published here uh, in clinical orthopedics back in 1992. It becomes a little even more complicated when you're adding in the fact that the patient is ACL insufficient and requires a reconstruction. So the question is, when a patient comes to your office with a torn ACL and you notice on their physical examination that they're in primary varus alignment, the question is, is there an indication for doing your high tibial osteotomy to correct that malalignment at the time of your primary ACL reconstruction? Uh, there have been a number of studies, including this one out of Korea, that looked at 201 patients that had torn ACLs in the setting of primary varus. And the authors found that stability and functional scores after the ACL reconstruction were not adversely altered by the primary varus alignment compared to a control group. So basically, the conclusion here was that performing a primary ACL reconstruction in this, you know, with a concomitant HTO has not gained widespread acceptance. That being said, we have all acknowledged that there is a role of coronal malalignment in cases of failed ACL reconstructions. There have been multiple studies that demonstrating that varus malalignment is an independent risk factor for clinical failure due to increased stresses on the ACL graft. Vanderpol showed that when the mechanical axis is anywhere medial to the tibial spine, stresses on the ACL graft are significantly increased. So basically, based on this data, every single failed ACL reconstruction that I see here in the office at NYU gets a set of long leg alignment films. And for me in my practice, malalignment is addressed in any case of failed ACL reconstructions where the mechanical axis 
passes medial to the medial tibial spine, as you see here. So if we're going to tackle this combined high tibial osteotomy to correct the varus malalignment with an ACL reconstruction, this in this case a revision, it requires a bit of preoperative planning. I like to utilize the Dugdale method, and it's depicted here. We pick a reference point that's set at 62.5% across the tibial plateau. It basically is the downsloping area just lateral to the lateral tibial spine. From that Dugdale's point, we draw lines from the center of the femoral head and then up from the center of the plafond. The angle formed by the intersection of these two lines is the correction angle. So here's an example of a, a failed ACL in the setting of varus malalignment. And here's my preoperative planning using the Dugdale method. So on the left set, on the left image, there's the mechanical axis drawn from the center of the femoral head to the center of the tibial plafond. And as you can see, it's medial to the tibial spine entering that medial compartment. The center image is Dugdale's point. And like we said, the, the angle formed by the intersection of these two lines, one drawn from the center of the femoral head and one up from the tibial plafond, that's our correction angle. And what I like to do to kind of just visualize the plan is on PowerPoint, I can create this simulation of the osteotomy. And in this case, a nine degree correction is gonna get me to Dugdale's point. So let's take you step-by-step step through the combined medial opening wedge, high tibial osteotomy and an ACL reconstruction. And there's no doubt there's a lot of steps involved, but if you take it one step at a time, it's something that can be done efficiently and effectively uh, within usually within an hour and a half to two hours. So we're gonna start with a diagnostic arthroscopy to assess the meniscal and cartilage integrity, specifically within the lateral compartment. We know from that preoperative plan that we're gonna be shifting the mechanical axis into that lateral compartment. So we wanna ensure the fact that the articular surfaces in that compartment are intact and capable of withstanding the increased loads that they're gonna see. We'll then do a complete intraarticular evaluation and take care of any associated procedures to the meniscus and debride any, de any cartilage lesions that need to be debrided. We're then gonna debride the remnant ACL and identify the anatomic site for the femoral tunnel. When you're combining an HTO and a revision ACL, it is usually utilizing an all inside technique as, de as was demonstrated by Dr. Shah. So we're gonna drill the femoral tunnel using this all inside technique with a retrograde reamer. And once that's done, we're gonna take the arthroscope and instruments out of the knee and approach the proximal tibia for the concomitant high tibial osteotomy. Compared to the old fashioned method utilizing a metal pudu plate, in addition to causing the potential for symptomatic hardware and the need for hardware removal at a later date, it, it was very difficult to basically perform a concomitant ACL because you'd have to thread the needle through the two proximal screws. The implant that I utilize for this combined procedure is really an evolution in the technique. The instrumentation is safer due to the, the utilization of what's called the neurovascular shield, which I'll show you shortly. Because the implant is flush with the medial surface of the tibia, it lacks hardware prominence and the eventual likelihood of a hardware removal being required. If the patient goes on and needs a total knee replacement, you can cut right through the peak implants. And importantly, for the sake of our discussion here tonight, you can perform a concomitant ACL with the tibial tunnel specifically drilled through the implant hole, as you see right here. So here's a couple of slides just outlining the technique for the high tibial osteotomy. I like to use a curvilinear incision along the proximal medial aspect of the knee. We'll expose the medial aspect of the tibia. We can put in and just template where this neurovascular protecting shield is gonna go posteriorly. And the implant has this, a, a, a jig set up that will create a protective cage around that medial aspect of the tibia to allow you to safely saw across coming into contact with metal all around, protecting the posterior neurovascular structures. Once the osteotomy is completed, we will then wedge it open to our planned correction angle, put in our implant. But what we're gonna do in this case is we're gonna leave that proximal medial, I'm sorry, that proximal lateral hole for our drilling of the tibial tunnel. So like we said, we're gonna utilize thoroscopy throughout this high tibial osteotomy uh, technique. We're gonna identify the appropriate site for the osteotomy. 
And one of the pearls of this technique is you want to undermine the patellar tendon insertion on the tibial tuberosity to maximize your tibial tunnel length. We'll make that osteotomy. We'll open it to correct alignment to Dugdale's point. We're then going to fix the osteotomy, like we said, leaving that proximal lateral hole for tibial tunnel drilling. Once the, oste once the osteotomy is complete and our implants in place and fixed with three of the four screws, we're going to insert the arthroscope back into the knee and drill our tibial tunnel with an all inside technique through that empty hole. We'll then pass and fix our ACL graft tensioned with cortical buttons, as you see here in the fluoroscopy image at the top. Here's our final output. As you see, the mechanical axis is now directly through Dugdale's point. We've got our fixation buttons for the ACL reconstruction and our osteotomy is created with that uh, peak implant. So there've been a number of studies looking at the outcomes of these combined HTO and ACL reconstruction procedures. In this study that was published in arthroscopy, the patients had an overall mean IKDC score of 73.4. The Lysholm score improved from a mean 46.2 pre-op to almost 85 postoperatively. The majority of patients were able to return to some level of athletic activity. And overall, the mean value of the alignment correction in this cohort was over seven degrees. In a similar study, a systematic review of combined HTO and ACL reconstructions was performed, and in every study analyzed, the IKDC score was improved over the preoperative baseline. When comparing combined ACL and high tibial osteotomies to HTO alone for this uh, pathology, the Lysholm score was significantly higher in the combined procedure. Every study analyzed in this systematic review showed improvement in functional outcome scores, and the alignment in these patients when combining the HTO and the ACL reconstruction changed from a preoperative one to almost nine degrees of varus to postoperatively just about almost seven and a half degrees of valgus. It is a big operation, like we said, with many steps, and it's not something that's without complications. The most common complications reported in the, in the literature for combining an osteotomy with an ACL reconstruction are DVTs, postoperative stiffness, and hematoma. Other complications you need to discuss with your patients include the need for revision HTO if you've if you made an error in your estimation and done a valgus overcorrection or any loss of fixation with your ACL graft. So to put it all together and give you guys a couple of minutes to, uh, to ask any questions about combining an HTO and an ACL reconstruction, coronal malalignment increases stresses on ACL grafts and is a risk factor for ACL reconstruction failure. As we demonstrated, a medial opening wedge high tibial osteotomy can correct your varus coronal malalignment, thus reducing stresses on your revision ACL graphs. It has a relatively low complication rate and good objective outcomes in the literature supporting doing these procedures together. So I'm hoping that you guys come away from this talk understanding that you need to pay attention to coronal, al coronal alignment in cases of ACL reconstruction failure, and don't be shy about adding in the corrective osteotomy if the mechanical axis passes medial to that medial tibial spine. Once again, thank you for your attention and joining us tonight, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Eric, great talk. Um, you know, quick question, especially when you're doing uh, osteotomies uh, in the revision setting. Um, any concerns with like tibial tunnel widening when you're performing these HTOs? And how do you address it if, if uh, you know, uh, if you think the tibial tunnel is significantly wide? Uh, Mel, you mean, you mean, prior to your revision and your HTO? Correct. So, you know, we are, we're, you know, we're very careful about analyzing the, you know, the, the imaging, you know, at, when we're planning a revision ACL reconstruction. And especially in one of these, um, in this, in, we're, we're, in, we're thinking about doing a combined HTO ACL, we're gonna really wanna pay attention to widening, especially that tibial tunnel. So it's not uncommon for me to do a two-stage revision procedure where I'll go in, we will basically bone graft the tunnels, give us the best chance that we're going to reconstitute pretty much normal bony anatomy before we tackle it with the bigger procedure because we want to increase the likelihood that this is going to be the last knee operation they need for quite a while. So if there's anything more than 14 millimeters in my practice, I'm going to say, all right, listen, we know what we need to do. We need to realign you. We're going to revise your ACL reconstruction. But in order to make that as successful a procedure as possible, we're going to do it in two stages in a conservative fashion 
We'll go in, we'll debride your ACL, we'll get everything set up, we'll bone graft your tunnels, and we'll come back in a few months and get you taken care of. Great. All right. Next, uh, our division chief, Leach Ezra, is going to talk about uh, uh, several techniques and, uh, and go through some cases uh, in ACL reconstruction. Great. Thanks, Mehul and Mike. Uh, this has been an outstanding course so far. I, I agree with Eric. I I'm learning a ton as we go through. You know, in the past, we've gone through these cases and asked questions along the way. So what I'd like to do is try to get through all these cases. And then in the setting of anonymity, you guys could send your questions, either bashing my approach to how I did this or really questioning whether you think my technique is valid. And I think that that will stimulate a lot of... Uh, you know, comments. So I have no major disclosures for this. So the first case is an ACL reconstruction uh, uh, that I did two years ago, but now the patient has recurrent instability after just simply stepping off a curb. So this is a 20 year old male non-contacting twisting injury to his left knee after coming down from a layup. This is after I initially saw him. He left knee examination, demonstrated an effusion, uh, he had the classic 2B Lockman. He did have a pivot. This is These are his MRIs showing the ACL tear. I, I, I hope everyone would agree that you can't repair this. Uh, the PCL is intact. Here's my images from the initial surgery. I did an outside-in technique drilling-wise, as uh, Dr. Shah showed, and here's his ACL reconstruction. Uh, we can argue on whether you think the tunnels are appropriate here, but you know, I, I would say that the tunnels are perfect here in the sense of both the tibial tunnel being appropriately not too posterior and the femoral tunnel being posterior enough. So why did this guy fail? And we can get into that later on uh, in the questions. You know, was his pivot playing a role? He certainly didn't have too much posterior slope and uh, he didn't have any significant varus. But now he presents 22, just slipped off a curb, retore his ACL. Uh, and I'll get into those images. Now his knee exam, mild swelling, still that 2B Lockman, still that pivot, and now here's, you know, imaging. So this MRI shows the ACLs, you know, at least the femoral tunnel is pretty posterior. Um, his alignment films are, are normal. He's not in any significant varus and no significant posterior slope. So the questions that we'll always ask with this are what graft type are you going to use? And we can get into whether you'd use contralateral BTB, quad on this guy who had a failed BTB, hamstrings. Um, are you going to use allograft on a person like this? What type of allograft? Autograft, different types of autograft. And these are all the questions that you guys could chime in and you can either disagree or uh, agree with my selection. And what additional procedures? Obviously, to do the same thing again would be moronic, not addressing some obvious issues in the patient, especially with such a mild non-contact re-injury of his ACL. To do it again would be just to subject it with failure. So here's his meniscus, fairly deficient. You can make an argument whether the guy needed uh, a meniscus transplant or not. You know, certainly I fixed it. And then the idea was that his tunnels were in good position. So we, I, I went with the idea of putting in an allograft in, and certainly this is up for discussion as a young patient, whether you choose to do um, some other graft. And then there's the reconstruction. Looks fine. Uh, and you can argue, maybe I wouldn't use an allograft in this case. But I think the key thing here is what else are you going to do and how are you going to address that pivot? And the idea is that we're going to address the pivot by doing something else, the IT band, and this is the modified Lemaire. I wanted to show it. I think it's important. I think it's important that everyone that's watching this learn how to do this. It's easy. It's not hard. There's a learning curve like it is with anything else, but it's something that's fairly you know, reasonable. We use the same kind of instruments we use for our ACL reconstruction. I'm sizing the IT band, and, and certainly you know, people ask, well, how long do you make it? I, I make it 40 millimeters long than the epicondyle. So typically it's about seven to eight centimeters. I'm drilling in a slightly proximally anterior position, and then I'm tensioning it in near full extension and neutral rotation, and I'm closing the IT band. So again, something that I think you, 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 we should all learn. And so that's that case. And certainly you could send in your questions and we can get to it later. So hey, now, quick, quick question. Yeah. Quick question. So when you're doing that modified Lemaire 
and you're drilling that femoral tunnel. What are your concerns about the femoral tunnel you just drilled with the ACL reconstruction? Yeah, so that's a great question, Nagel. So for me, I'm always aiming proximal and anterior. And if I'm hitting something that's hard, I use metal screws. So I know if I'm hitting the metal screw or not. And so for me, if that's the case, then I'll bring in an image. But realistically, as long as you have that metal screw there and you're going proximal and anterior enough, you're going to diverge from the tunnel. There are other people who you will uh, drill that tunnel and look to see inside the knee whether they're converging or not. And I, cer I certainly think that's fine. For me, I've gotten comfortable with it and, and certainly I've not had any issues with tunnel convergence. And, and another question about the Lemaire was there's a concern about drilling across the femur and heading medially. Do you have any concerns about injuring the neurovascular bundle medially when you're drilling the, that that guy. So, so I guess the question, neurovascular bundle, meaning the saphenous nerve and vein, not the main bundle. Uh, I, I'm assuming with the main bundle, there's no way that you're going to hit the main bundle because you're drilling at the epicondyle, slightly anterior and, and, and proximal. So there's no way. Uh, uh, in terms of the the saphenous nerve, as you're exiting medially, you're you're anterior, so you're not going to hit that. Yeah, they were worried about the saphenous. Yeah. Yeah, you're anterior enough. It shouldn't be a problem. So this next case, 23-year-old male basketball player, history of two previous ACL reconstructions, BTB auto failed, then Tibant, uh, you know, Tibant with suspensory fixation failed. Presents, same thing, Tubi Lockman, you know, plus two pivot. Um, so little different this case. All right, let me go. Sorry about that. Um, so here is x-rays. You can see the, the, the tunnels, and you get a sense that maybe we're a little wide here. Um, maybe not so much on the tibia, but the femur looks wide, and this is certainly one I would get a CAT scan on. And so I measured the femoral tunnel at 14.5 millimeters. And get into this, whether you would – uh, graft it. And then as we get to the tibia, 15.8 millimeters. Again, you know, worth the discussion on whether you would graft it or not. Um, and then here's just some more measurements about the tunnel positioning. Tunnel looks reasonably located posteriorly and some 3D imaging. In this case, I don't think it helped me that much other than showing that the femoral tunnel was okay. All right. So the question's obvious. Are you bone grafting the tunnels? Or are you doing another are you doing a single uh, procedure? And what's your threshold? You know, certainly for me, as it starts to approach 15 and above, that uh, millimeters in diameter, that's when I'm starting to graft. And also when the patients had two prior failures and the last failure was some sort of allograft that was causing the tunnel widening, that was all soft tissue, I'm bone grafting the tunnels. And we can get in, into this in the questions. So here's the, here's the bone grafting. I use dowels in this case. Here's the bone um, dowel on the tibia, and here it is on the femur. Uh, so I waited, uh, in this case, I think four to six months. Uh, I think it was closer to six months, but certainly four months, you can get a CAT scan or x-ray to see if it's healed. Really confirm that there's no axis deviation. Confirm that there's no excessive you know, posterior uh, tibial slope on the coronal. In this case, there wasn't. Here's a shot showing the tunnels filled with bone, and then... The uh, the next question is, once you've confirmed it's healed, what are your graft options? So this is great, right? This guy's more of an elite athlete, 23, pro basketball player. W what are you going to do? So I, I, I think the, the question is, for me on this case, I think after a failed BTB, we can decide on, do you think allograft's an option? For me, as we get into these lead athletes, I'm leaning away from allograft. Uh, I, I think the next question is quad tendon. I think this is a reasonable approach. Hamstrings is another option. But for me, this was a case I did contralateral BTB on him. And then, again, are you going to do the same thing over again that failed two times prior? So this is a case where you've got to do something along the lateral structures. If it's not an osteotomy that he needs, then he needs something laterally, either an ALL reconstruction or – a modified lumen. And over the years, 
I think everyone at NYU has gravitated towards doing a modified Lemaire because biomechanically it's stronger. And for me, something like, uh, and you'll see in this video, this is how I did this case. Um, and so this is how we used to do them. I, I would say maybe the video is not running well in this case, but we did this percutaneously where we had a, a, a graft, you know, that was a, a simple, uh, you know, semitendinosis that was going along the outside of the knee. And I would argue, looking at this video now, I'm almost embarrassed to think that this simple graft along the ladder, outside of the knee almost superficial would be able to control, you know, you know, uh, rotational instability. So, uh, you know, I do not use this technique anymore. I'd be interested to see what the panel, we could question them later on and what people out there think. But, you know, for me, this is just something that's not able to really control the stability and the rotation as a, as a Lemaire, uh, would do. Um, and I, I'm going to just get to the video, uh, get through this video for the sake of time. But, you know, for me, the modified Lemaire on, the, on, on a case like this is what, what I'm really doing. Wait, wait, another question from the audience was, would you do a Lemaire if there's any lateral compartment arthritis? If the patient's rotationally unstable and he's failed, the answer is yes. Now, if, if there's valgus malalignment, Along, on, along that lines with the arthritis and the patient has lateral compartment pain, I'm doing, uh, uh, you know, an osteotomy as well. Okay, so this is the Pete's case. Uh, Pete's case. I'm just trying to touch on a case from everyone. I'll get through this quick. 12-year-old male, left, uh, left knee ACL injury while skiing, continued pain after bracing. He's a Tanner 1. Three years of growth remaining. So, you know, here's his ACL, this kid, you know, wide open plates. So for me, you know, and, and we can discuss this further, anyone who's a Tanner one or two with open growth plates, three or four years of growth remaining, that's, you know, I'm using a physical sparing technique on both sides. You know, I use, I still use the hamstring technique and we can get into whether the quad's better or not. I'm using flip cutters. As Mayhul had brought up in Cordelia, you know, for me, I'm I'm harvesting both the semi T uh, uh, and the uh, gracilis, and I'm getting eight or nine all the time. Uh, and I think for me, that's critical. That got to the point you you can't just use a seven or a six in these patients; they're going to fail. Um, you know, the, depending on the technique, you got to get a special length. But the idea is to really take these two tendons and really make them one and use a lot of suturing to, to, to make them one. And I think that gets into the, uh, the length of time and preparation of this graft and whether the quad is better. The idea is that the, you use a pediatric drill guide, drill guide, set it at 95. If you're using this technique already for outside in drilling, it's easy. Uh, you just got to get an image there, make it more parallel. So instead of 120 degrees, make it 95 degrees and then uh, you know, drill. So I, I think this has made this case, you know, a case that um, a sports medicine surgeon could, you know, do rather than a ped sports surgeon. So this is the kid, he's got a, a pivot, you know, and we can get into whether we in the pediatric population, whether you would add a Lemaire on this case, and how you would do that in a, in a physical sparing way. So you know, you could use a large image or mini CR might choose to use a large image, you know, in terms of Get comfortable harvesting the hamstrings. I think after you do a ton, use a closed stripper. It's easy. You can't mess it up if you use a closed tendon stripper, you know, and then really suture the hell out of this. Get Make these one. And I think that's where we run into issues with uh, this. In terms of how are you going to do the drilling, you know, here's the torn ACL. You're not doing a big notch plasty in a kid like this. You're, you're, you're doing sort of mini notch plasty. You're finding that back wall. And when you use the outside in drilling, it's easy. You're seeing everything, seeing through the medial portal. There's the large C-arm. Uh, this is actually a nine reamer. So even on this small kid, I was able to use a nine reamer. Some of the tricks with drilling, uh, you know, on the epiphysis, you got to really come in posterior medial on this at an angle. And this is how you want that to look. 
And then you're passing the graph using, you know, the tightrope buttons and you get a, a, a nice size nine graft in there. I think that's, uh, you know, the, it, it looks really good. And this kid did, you know, you know, certainly quite well. Uh, let me see. Mail, do we have time for another case? Or do you want to get into questions? I think we have time for one, one more case. Okay. 32-year-old male, right knee pain and instability. Okay. So this guy, ACL uh, tear, reports tearing ACL 14 years ago playing basketball. He went BTB autographed, then retore it again playing basketball. And then he had a revision ACL with allograft. Retort seven years later. Okay. He he underwent an outside a stage tunnel bone grafting and then a third procedure revised again. So I, I think what you're seeing here is a guy who kept on having some version of the same procedure being redone. And, and I think that as as uh, surgeons out there looking at this, you've got to you ask yourself, what's going on? What am I missing here? And why do I? Why, why has he had the same thing done over? So when you get these cases, you try to figure out what was done wrong. Was it a technical thing, or are you missing something with you know his bony alignment? Are you missing something? Does he need a lamer? Does he need some type of rotational control? Um, he's not a smoker. Now you could see it on this. So I'm obviously pointing you to the right direction. So maybe his femoral tunnel is a little vertical, but it's not horrible. But look at that slope, 16 degrees. Typically normal is, is about 90. So right there, I'm looking at, uh, you know, something that if I'm going to do something on this guy, I need to, rec I need to correct that. Um, again, does he have significant varus on his knee? He has some varus. This, this individual had a medial deficient meniscus. So the idea was if I'm thinking osteotomy on this guy, well, uh, and not only am I going to correct his slope, both in the sagittal plane, but I'm probably going to correct his slope in the coronal plane on this. Um, so here, is his, here are his MRIs. Hold on, I'll go back to that. Let me see if I can get that running. I'm sorry. Leith, while you get the video going, you know, if you're, you know, why don't we talk about, you know, if you're planning a cartilage procedure and an osteotomy, what, what's your thought processes in, staging you know when do you do do you do the cartilage first do you do the cartilage after osteotomies can you explain yeah, your thought you, processes so this always comes up and you know there's no right answer to this the right answer is whatever you're comfortable with as long as in the end the patient gets treated correctly so if you don't want to have the patient under anesthesia for four hours or that's a long procedure for you or you're just starting out learning this stuff uh, I, I think there's nothing wrong with staging it and, uh, you know, to whatever extent you want. And anyone that criticized that, I think is, it, it's problematic for me because I think when you have a patient on the table for six hours, you know, cause you want to try to do everything at one time, I think that's where you run into problems. And then you, you, you get into situations where the incorrect thing is not you know, uh, is done on the patient for the sake of time and, and other stuff. So, you know, my answer is stage, whatever you want. I don't think there's a wrong answer. However, if you're doing an arthrotomy in the knee and to do something else, then to me, you know, it, it, you may as well just add whatever you need. So you don't have to redo the arthrotomy in the patient. Um, so in this case, large bone again, the femur, not so bad. Uh, uh, only, uh, uh, eight or 7.9, maybe 12 on that one. Certainly the tibia was a little larger. At one point I got it 19.6. So I'm bone grafting the tibia on this. So here's this case and male. Great question. I staged this guy very loose. Obviously he's going to need something more, um, than, uh, uh, a simple, uh, correction. Um, so, you know, the video froze a little bit, but this is where, I used 3D printing cutting guide to do a biplanar osteotomy. You hear a lot about this, and I and I, as we go through this, I'm going to discuss it. So the first goal was again preparing for the osteotomy. I bone grafted the uh, uh, that tibial tunnel. I staged this because this was the first time I did this biplanar correction with this system. So I didn't want to you know play around with it. So with this system, 
you, you send them uh, the information, the correction you want to make, and it'll tell you based on this guide where to do the cut. It's 3D printed. So if you're going to correct both coronal alignment and sagittal alignment, in this case, your hinge is going to be anterior lateral. So you can decrease the slope and open up medially. And that's that's all it is. It's not complicated. It's just understanding and telling the engineers, uh, you know, what you want. And then here's the cut, you know. So in this case, you're going, you have to go across the whole tibia in order uh, to correct that uh, increased posterior slope. And you can see I'm breaking through that lateral cortex. And, and these are things where we go, oh my God, you can't do that with a simple HTO. But it's a biplanar osteotomy, so it's slightly different. And I, and I think the case is to understand that you're correcting and you're opening it up more in the back than in the front. And you can see here, I, I to just protect myself, I have that laminar spreader in the back and making sure based on my preoperative correction that I know exactly how much that is. Then the plate screws are already pre-drilled at the setting so that when you put these screws in, it's at the right setting in terms of doing plate doing the correction for you. I tamp in some, you know, bone graft in the back. And, uh, you know, this is one where I, I think the, the concept of doing these osteotomies has been made easier. So I brought him back down to normal at nine degrees. And I also corrected his coronal alignment, getting him out of valgus and taking pressure off the inside of his knee. Um, and then just to wrap this case up, I staged them six months later. I did an ACL uh, auto BTB on him. Um, are, are you able to get your tunnels around that? Uh, yeah. Yes, you are. Right. No, so I was lucky that. So I was, I was prepared. I had waited eight months on him. Uh, actually six months to take the, I was prepared to take out at least some of the screws proximally. I only had to take out one screw to get it in. And then the last case, Mayhill, I'm not going to get into is a case that, uh, you know, Eric presented. It was a coronal malalignment, failed ACL with medial OA. You know, I did an ACL HTO with the eye balance and we can get into, you know, that as well. Like, there's one question. When, when you're correcting your tibial slope, the audience wants to know, um, what are you correcting it to? Are you correcting it to normal? Or are you are you correcting it shy of normal? No, I'm correcting it to normal. So the normal range for posterior tibial slope is, is wide. It could be from six to eleven. Uh, so I try to correct it right in the middle to about nine degrees. All right. Uh, and another question they had about your case. When you're doing that modified Lemaire and you're and you're and you're opening it up laterally, um, you're making a lateral incision. The, the question is, why don't you do that first and then use that lateral incision to to uh, place a guide or drill outside in through that lateral incision? Okay, uh, uh, I get it. You know, rather than uh, the, I, I guess if you're not comfortable doing the. Uh, uh, the outside in technique, I, I think that's reasonable. You know, for me, I just gotten comfortable, you know, doing that part of the case that way and, and drilling through, uh, I, right. I don't think there's any, you know, need for that, but it's perfectly fine. I think making the lateral incision first, there's no harm in that. Right. I mean, I think for, for those, uh, uh, in the audience who haven't done the outside in technique, you know, you have to realize it's, it's really through a poke hole. It's not really even through anything more than, than, a, than a poke hole. Right. And it is not, I, I want to, it took me a little while to kind of get comfortable with that outside in drilling. I drilled, you know, I do it like Mayhul and uh, uh, Alea and even uh, Strauss used to do it, drilling in posterior with a medial portal. But, you know, it, it just took me a little while to get comfortable with the guide, but I find it far easier than, than uh, you know, medial portal drilling technique. All right, guys. Well, uh, I, first, I want to thank all my uh, co-presenters uh, and uh, uh, co-moderators for this. Uh, it was a, a great talk. I think I learned, I certainly learned a lot from all of you, and uh, I hope you guys had fun uh, to our audience. Um, also, um, if you have any questions, please feel free uh, to reach out. Um, our emails are all uh, firstname.lastname at nyulangone.org. Um, reach out with questions. We'll be happy to help you in any way. Take care, guys, and have a good night.